Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 129 of the Effort Report, pandemic episode 17, I believe. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Peng. And we have, we're covering a lot of ground today. And our tentative title is when the hypothesis apparently is already fact. This is a good one. It's a good one. Maybe, I don't know if that title really is engaging enough, but we'll see. No, well, it doesn't have meaning until we kind of detail what we're talking about. Right, right. So. Follow up and other small things. Uh, yes. Do you want, let's um do the uh, email first. Okay. Poll and cover letters. Right. We got an email from a listener who... And I don't remember what episode we talked about this in. We, we talked about whether we write cover letters when we submit manuscripts to be reviewed for publication. And neither of us writes cover letters for those. Well, can I re- revise? <laughs> oh, you lied? You lied? I want to uh, clarify. Oh, clarification. Yeah. So I don't think, I, I don't think we said that we don't write cover letters, right? Um. I think I like I definitely write cover well it, it, I definitely write cover letters if only because they're usually required, right? Yeah, I don't think the places I submit usually require them. So I don't I Re- Okay, so that's like news to me actually. <laughs> so I don't you know, there's like this web platform and you upload stuff and you click submit and it builds a PDF and you know, there's other stuff that's required, but a cover letter is not required or there may be there was one journal I submitted to recently where something like that was required, but it was like this short little text box that you filled in. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. That's like every journal now, right? I mean. Right. So you just say, you know, dear edit- editors, uh, you know, please find the attached manuscript entitled blah, blah, blah. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not saying, I, I'm just saying I wanted to make the distinction between like having literally nothing and having a cover letter. That's just, that it's like perfunctory, but still exists. And at least, you know, demonstrates a level of civilization, you know. Oh, so you're saying I'm not civilized. Well, I mean, if your journal doesn't require it, then it's like then there's nothing you can do. I just that's actually I find surprising. But oh, uh, oh. Um, every journal that I've submitted to requires it. But but I never write anything particularly informative in the cover letter. Right. It's beyond the title. <laughs> Good. Yes. Yeah. So just you, to be clear. Just you know, to be clear. Because I value precision. Now that we have clarity. So then I put a poorly worded poll out in response to this email from a listener who was surprised that, you know, I, I think what we said is we don't do it unless like we're, we're forced to and that it tends to be perfunctory, maybe to summarize. And so this person was surprised and suggested a poll so we put a twitter poll out and 85 percent of people said that they generally include a cover letter and then the remaining 15 percent were roughly split between no and sometimes okay but i think this was like unfortunate (laughs) in the wording (laughs) yes it was a poorly worded poll because i wrote the poll and the general the you know the Journals that I tend to submit to don't tend to require it. Yeah. So maybe we should, should we have a second poll? Yeah. Do you want to be in charge of wording it since I failed? (laughs) Uh, Sure. If I can remember to do it. Uh, Do you want me to remind you to remember to do it? (laughs) No, don't remind me. It'll either happen or it won't. Okay. So we'll see. And so the email actually said that some journals uh, require, this from the listener, that what information should be in the cover letter, which I don't think I've. Well, maybe I have seen, but so I don't know. I guess like I used to write really long, like informative cover letters and and then I stopped, I think <laughs> at some point. I think after I became an editor, that's when I stopped. You stopped. Well, I don't know what purpose they really like. I don't think it makes your case any better. No, because I think if you think of the decision process of the editor, right, or the associate, usually it'll go to an associate editor if it's like a reasonable paper. I mean, it. You, first of all, it, the cover letter is just going to be like a condensed version of the abstract, essentially, right? Right. Um, perhaps with some details that you wouldn't normally put in a paper, but I can't really think of what those would be. That's sort of what my sense was. It's like I just didn't understand. It felt very redundant. Yeah. So, like, I think as an editor, my, like, dis- my decision process would be like, I look at the title. I'd be like, does this title even belong in this journal? Right. 
And if it does seem like it belongs in the journal, then I'll look at the abstract. And if it looks plausible, right, from the abstract, then I'll flip through the paper. And if it looks like it's, you know, of interest, then it goes to the associate editor, I think, right? Or it goes to reviewers. Right, right. I don't, I just don't see where the cover letter, like, plays a role. in. Like, I can see, like, if you're... <laughs> wow, this is like this year... <laughs> We've got you like worked up about the cover letter. Well, do you disagree? No, I'm I'm totally with you, but you know, that's why I don't write cover letters. So I, I guess what I'm just I'm dying to hear like someone say, well, here's how, here's exactly why the cover letter is important. There's got to be editors who listen to this podcast, at least one or two associate editors that listen, right? Right, right. This doesn't totally answer the question, but I asked Bill this, my husband. Do you write cover letters? And like I discovered something new about him 25 years on, 25 years plus into this relationship. Of course I write a cover letter, he says. I'm like, well, what what is in it? He's like, well, I have this kind of template, you know, and I'll replace the title. And then I have two sentences that I update with the paper that explains, you know, what the impact of the paper is. So he does it. But if he has a template, like it can't be that <laughs> important, right? That's that's my conclusion from that conversation. All right. Well, okay, the only thing that I can think of, and I would not personally do this, but I could see how it could come up, is that if your paper is like implicitly trashing another paper and you don't but it would be inappropriate to like <laughs> say that in the paper, like, right? You could in the cover letter being like, say, say, like, you know, Matsui et al. wrote this horrible paper and we're responding to it and explaining why, you know, she's wrong. Right, right. I don't even know if I would say that in the cover letter, but I could see how maybe you could. Wow, you're like... I'm stretching. I'm going to throw out a new... Yeah, that's an edge case. But I could definitely see how, like, some authors might be more inclined to do that. But I, that's clearly not what... That, like, that wasn't what Bill was saying, right? Like, he says he just has a form letter that he sends every time, right? Well, no, he... It's... There and then there are like two sentences in it that he rewrites. That's what a form letter is. Yes. Well, no, <laughs> form letter is the exact same thing, but maybe you change the title. No, 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 no. Form letter, you change the name. You change like dear. So the title, you, the title. Yeah, but and then, like, and then you also change like a sentence or two here and there. You know, it's based on a database. Yes, he has a form letter. I don't know why he does it. So my homework, you're gonna redo the poll. I'm gonna ask him, like, whether he thinks it makes a difference or not, and why. Okay. And then we'll then we'll like put this issue to bed for once and for all. <laughs> this very controversial topic. Clearly, yes. All right. Next up is the National Academies. So the last episode, I mentioned the National Academies of Science because I I was talking to someone there about like a committee about space, and it was really cool. So anyway, that's but that's not what I want to talk about. I, it occurred to me that I think many people may not know like how the National Academies of Science works or like what they do or how they operate. So, yeah, or, so or what it is. Or what it is for that matter, yeah. So I thought it'd be worth just to take a few minutes just to talk about what it is and why it's interesting. Um, so one of, the, one of the problems with the National Academies is that they've had like six names in the last like 10 years. I, I, they always ch are changing their names. So it's a little hard to keep track of. But um, basically the National Academies of Science was created by in the 18 something or others by Lincoln uh 1863 63 okay yes by lincoln to kind of like assemble the nation's best scientists to address questions of interest to the country right right am i, re am I doing this right i think so i'm i'm okay. following along on sort of um i'm on their website so okay. I'm <laughs> you can correct me if i say anything real time fact checking <laughs> right <laughs> that's, that's what today's day and age is about you know we need it um so there's so over time, there's, there's the National Academies of Science, there's the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, there used to be something called the Institute of Medicine, but now it's just called the National Academy of Medicine. Um, and all of them together are the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. <laughs> I think that's what their official name is now. Um, and each group has a, has like a collection of people who are nominated and like and kind of put and like elected to that group, whether it's the science, engineering, or medicine. Um, and, uh, and it's very prestigious. It's, uh, you know, it's like a prestigious body of people, right? 
and it's so what do they do right so the way i think it works now i don't know how it worked in the past but basically government usually government agencies need a question that's to answer or a question that needs to be addressed by the scientific community um and so they sponsor uh what's called a study and the study is not like a research study uh where they're like you're going out and like collecting data in the field usually not i don't think but it's a study to kind of address a certain question so for example uh one that i was on was like the national science foundation was the sponsoring organization and they were interested in like on in a question about how the field of computer science could address environmental sustainability okay yeah so so they wanted to know what they could do about that right so they went to the national academies and said here's a question for you we're going to give you some money to assemble a group of scientists to like write a report on this question so i was on that committee along with like six other people and we met uh we had a bunch of meetings um and uh we had a workshop where we got outside people to like give uh, talks and presentations um and uh and it's kind of like our data collection process essentially and uh, and then we wrote a report called Computing and I can't remember what it's called, Computing and Sustainability. That, that was a workshop proceedings report. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a not a workshop proceedings report. It was like a full on report report with recommendations, et cetera. Yeah. So so there are, and to, to, I think to be clear about one thing is that people get kind of elected to be members. But and those members, I think, looking at the website, because I was wondering like what their obligations are, they don't really have any formal duties that are required, but they can be invited to participate, it says, in the governance and advisory activities. But membership is different than being a non-member who volunteers for some of this work. And the Correct. majority of people are people like you and me who have volunteered for this kind of work, but are not members of the National Academies. Right. So, yeah. So when they assemble these committees to like do these studies, uh, I would say the vast majority of the mem- of the people on those committees are not formal members of the academies. Right. So the, the election to like the academies is kind of this, you know, prestigious um, like recognition or, or award. And I get the sense, although I could be wrong, that like part of, kind of being elected is also some track record of having, you know, volunteered for their activities and their studies that they do. I think, yeah, I think it helps if they've heard of you. Right, right. Yes, yes. And yeah. and there are different types of things they do. Like one is, and I just learned this recently because I am on um, a committee that they just impaneled that's planning the workshop and there will be workshop proceedings that come from that. But that's different than doing the study, which is basically um, that committee, you know, reviewing the literature and and putting together a report of the literature, which can take a long time. And then there's another type of committee. So they have workshop planning committees. They have like committees that do a study themselves and create this you know, quite lengthy, in-depth um, document, more like a tome. And then the other kind is another one that I participated in where you just serve in, ad- in an advisory capacity. And so the one that I participated in that serves in an advisory capacity was that the State Department was seeking guidance about um, um, they, of course, deploy employees to posts that are in high air pollution parts of the world. And they wanted advice and guidance in terms of like, you know, how to navigate and manage that and communicate um, to their employees. And so there, there's not like a document or a workshop that comes out of it. I'm not aware of any other types of, of activities that they, you could volunteer for, but. Yeah, I've never, well, I've never participated in any other <laughs> yes, yes. And, and to be and i'm using the term volunteer like you could just sort of email them and say oh hey i'd like to volunteer for this set or the other but it doesn't quite work that way you're invited to volunteer there was there used to be something called the national national research council uh but i don't think it exists anymore <laughs> at least i couldn't find any reference to it on their website anymore so which was kind of like 
like an operational arm of the academy. So it's like if they wanted to do something in particular. Oh, that wasn't commissioned by another group or agency. I think so. But yeah, but now I can't find any reference to it on its website. So I think they got rid of it. But I don't know. Uh, tw- oh, no, this is Canada. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So um, anyway, that's just it's a it's an interesting group of people. Uh, it's an interesting organization. I think uh, they have a beautiful building down in Washington D.C. Back when you could go to buildings, right? They have a couple of beautiful buildings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you 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 have meetings in the lesser building. Yeah. And I would say, like, if you ever get asked to do one of these things, in general, I would recommend it. Um, it is an, it's a nice experience. So for me, it was nice because I got to meet like a lot of people from very different like areas. Right. And, um, but I don't know, maybe just been because the stuff that I did, but, um, and it's kind of like, it feels a little bit like a study section, where, but, but it isn't as hard work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's cause you're doing something that's, I think a little bit more, uh, engaging. Perhaps. I, I think it can be a ton of work though. It depends it can, on which. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on how much writing you have to do, actually. Right, right. <laughs> That's what it yes. comes down to. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's uh, anyway. So I think I would recommend it. Would you? I think generally, yes. My like um, my. I think I mentioned this before. One of my favorite activities is that uh, standing committee um, that I just mentioned about you know air pollution exposure and. Um, other areas of the world with high levels of air pollution where the state department has posts and that I've like learned a ton and, you know, met people who, um, you know, have all sorts of kind of complementary expertise to mine. And it's, it's, it's been actually a really great experience. And I remember when I think I kind of this crazy schedule not this fall, but the fall before when I was putting together the P50. And it turned out that this is when I didn't look at my calendar, right? I only looked to see if the days were free when I was asked to travel. Do you remember right. this whole discussion? As to the days around uh, them, yes, yes, exactly. And so I was like trying to see if there were, you know, meetings that I could either call into or what have you. And um, and so my admin was like, well, what about this National Academy one? And I was like, well, I'm not giving a talk or anything at it. But that's my favorite one. So, I'm not right. Right. <laughs> so, so I, I'm a fan. And then I just joined this one that's like a workshop planning committee. And we've just had our first meeting. And it's actually sponsored by the National Academy of Engineering, that particular sub. And so I think not everybody, but the vast majority of the people are um, engineers. It's about indoor particulate matter. And it looks to be a good group, too. There is there seems to be quite a bit of workshop planning, at least from my personal experience. Yeah, I didn't I think I hadn't connected the dots that this was one of the things that they do. But interestingly, I will say this, which is that um, you know, looking around um at the workshop planning committee, I suspect that all the others or almost all the other volunteers um are in hard money positions. Well, if it's an engineering committee, I mean, yeah. Yes. And it just got me thinking about um, how in some ways, and we've, I mean, this was the whole, like we talked about the effort reporting and all this at the very beginning of, you know, the lot, 128 episodes ago, almost, I think, um, that they're sort of supported in a way by their institution to do this kind of work. Because um, there's sort of an expectation that you get a nine month you know, salary, and that does pay to help support their teaching, but there's other activities that they do. And um, so that kind of arrangement to me just makes a lot of sense. Whereas, you know, when you're on a completely soft money job, you're doing this, you know, I think you have to think very carefully about the time commitment because I view it as you're essentially volunteering for this out of your own personal time because no one's paying you for it. No one's explicitly. I think it's yeah, it's way worse for you because <laughs> no one's really no one's explicitly paying for you to do this, um, and I think um, yeah, it's it feels much more like you're volunteering, and and that's totally cool. But you just have to like like I have a feeling that I hard money people who are asked 
maybe think harder about it than, I mean, think less hard about it than people who are entirely on soft money positions. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I think they are competing with other priorities. But um, yes, I'm not sure that's 100% true. But it is the, the, the financial arrangement obviously is very different. Anything else about the National Academies? Uh, I don't think so. All right. I have um, a conundrum that I need your help with. Let's hear it. I'm not exactly sure the order in which this happened. And this is almost kind of embarrassing to like tell the story because it illustrates like how not on top of things I am, even though it appears that I'm quite on top of things. So I got an email at some point in time from someone who runs like a the training program and in I think pediatric pulmonary allergy immunology and sleep medicine um, and puts together you know the talks for a year like they have a seminar series um, and she asked me to talk about um, you know housing and um, because suddenly you know my popularity has skyrocketed because of all of this people have woken up and sort of seen like, oh, social determinants of health, housing and environmental exposure. So I was asked to give this talk and it's, you know, to like a group of trainees. And I kind of recall, you know, that it was sometime in December, but I had all these grants due. And so I just over Thanksgiving was kind of like, I think I have a talk in the beginning of December. Um, And I looked and, and sure enough, this Friday, so just a few days from now, I'm supposed to give this talk. Well, sometime after I got that invitation, I got an invitation from the pediatric department or someone in the department asking me to give grand rounds on the same topic in March at the same institution. Okay. Just to be clear, because I have discovered that people are sometimes confused over these words. Um, department is bigger than division. Yes. And division is even bigger than, you know, a seminar series whose audience are fellows. Right. Okay. Just to make the hierarchy there. Okay. Yeah. No, that's important. And so I've been asked to give a talk on the same general topic at the same institution. You know, at, these are a few months apart. There are distinct differences in kind of the audience and the hierarchy or the scale of the audience. Um, You know, and I have kind of, it's not totally can, like I will tweak it a little bit depending on, oh, there's some more interesting data I can add to it. But I have kind of like the general slides for this sort of talk that I've, you know, given a half a dozen times. So this is my conundrum. What do I do? Do I just give the same exact talk? To- what what makes you uncomfortable here? I feel like I need to offer something that that there should be some differences between those two talks. Do you, do you want to give the impression that in the like two months between the talks you like public you like came up with a new finding or something like that? No. Then what? So this is what I've done. I I think that if you've been asked to give a talk at the same institution, that there's going to be the, the my audience on Friday is going to be in the audience in March. I want to give them something a little bit different, not entirely different than what they hear from me in December. What makes you think they'll be there in March? Most of, not 100% of the time, but to a large degree, they're likely to be there. But wouldn't they be like, I saw her give this talk in December, so I don't have to see it now? That's a possibility. <laughs> I think you should count on it. <laughs> I mean, that's what I would say. That's what you would say. So you just give the same talk and not worry about it. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, if there's some news thing that occurs between now and then, you could make reference to it, you know. Um, or if some new paper comes out, you know, you could talk about it. But fundamentally i would just give the same talk i mean three i mean three months apart what could you do yeah unless there's some like you did you unless there's some like very different objective for this second talk you know like i want like they want you to talk about something broader or narrower or what you know whatever right. i mean i think no i think they're they're the same right i only have a l- limited repertoire yeah and you need to lean into that you know just 
own it. Look, this is this is who I am. This is what I'm going to talk about. So I already mixed things up for the Friday talk that's happening in a few days. Okay. So what I did was, and maybe this is bad because it's not entirely what they expect, is I have the first half of the talk focused on, you know, housing and um, how that affects, you know, respiratory health and its connection to like redlining and so forth. So, and then the second half of the talk, I had prepared a talk about um, bias and racism and sort of the design and execution of research. And so the second half of the talk is that. Oh my God, there's like radio silence on the other end. Oh no, I, I thought you were going to keep going. <laughs> no, okay. so that, so, so I shrunk the, I cover housing and disparities in the first half at sort of a higher level. And then I pair it with how kind of uh, research can go astray and, you know, get us to this place where, you know, we're just now grappling with this obvious problem that's been in existence for decades. Yeah. I, so the first one is for like the fellows, you said, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking that I thought you were going to go in the direction of like, well, maybe for this first one, you could include something that's like more practical in nature, you know, like, here's what you should do going forward or whatever, you know, or here's what you should think about as you plan, you know, your future studies or whatever. And I think that was sort of the idea about this is that even if, I mean, most of them will have a research requirement. And if they don't, you know, they're in journal clubs. And so this is also sort of a tool for like, uh, provide sort of a framework or a lens through which one can evaluate research. Yeah. Yeah. So that I feel like could be almost like tutorial in nature, like at least part of it, right? Uh, whereas like a department seminar you would not it would not be appropriate i think yeah i yeah that's that was kind of my thinking but you articulated it you extracted it and packaged it up better than i did because you know i'm good at making the same thing sound different yes (laughs) phew so i'm making a mountain out of a molehill it sounds like totally yeah just give that same talk for the rest for the rest of your rest of my life all right done well let me in all seriousness though like an important topic like this, like you're going to kind of have to, I mean, unfortunately, I guess you could say, you're going to kind of have to give the same talk for a while, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and I have, like I, I've given some version of this talk easily a half a dozen times over the past year. Yeah. I Just, just think about like if you were like running for president, for example, and you're like out on the campaign trail and, and just think about how often they give that same speech. <laughs> Right. Like, yeah, there's a paragraph here about foreign policy or maybe there's a paragraph here about domestic, you know, whatever. And But it's the same speech every time. Right. Do you think people are like, I can't believe he gave that same speech again? I've heard people say that. Oh, I've heard this. He gives the same talk every time. Doesn't seem to prevent him from getting elected. <laughs> well, yes. Well, I was talking about like, you know, some professor or something. But yes. Oh, yeah. I think you need to, um, you know. Own it. Just own it. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Problem solved. Done. Look at this. We're solving problems on the effort report. We so rarely do that. All right. I'm dying to know what this next topic is about. So you don't know what faculty power sentences are? No. So I got this email. and It's the kind of email that you get. And initially, I think the initial reaction for many people would be to just kind of roll your eyes. Uh, but then as I thought about it, I was like, okay, this is how it works. All right. So... Every university, every school, every like department, whatever, has like some marketing material, right? Uh, like, for example, we have the Johns Hopkins Public Health Magazine, right? Or the Johns Hopkins University Magazine, or there's some newsletter that goes out or whatever, some sort of material like that. Every, school, every university school has it, right? Um, and in those things, they ha- often highlight faculty members, right? Their research, their, what they're doing, et cetera, right? Yeah. And and so one of the ways that they do this is they'll often include like a picture of you, you know, and like a little blurb that's like summarizes what you do, right? Because maybe they're doing a, a, a series on like faculty who work on environmental health or whatever, right? And so where do these little blurbs come from, right? They come from you, right? Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so that's like not like they didn't make them up, right? Because they don't, they can't describe in two sentences what your research is, right? So, um, 
the pe- me, by they meaning the people who make the magazine, right? So, and so sometimes like I'll look at the magazine and like, how come they don't, how come, you know, you might be like, how come they don't feature, you know, pediatric allergists or how come they never feature any biostatisticians in the magazine, right? It's because you don't have a power sentence. Is this what you're getting at? It's because, yeah, it's, well, it sounds stupid, but I think that is the reason, right? It's like, you want to be featured, you have to like write these things, right? And it sounds stupid, but it's like you write two sentences, like it might take five minutes maybe right and so it costs you nothing <laughs> right and then they can have this library of like of p- things to pull from when they when they need something for the magazine you know and uh and because i think when you see these things it often seems like oh well they they gave this person special treatment and they like wrote up a whole profile on them you know and it's like no they just you know they wrote they took five minutes to like write a sentence <laughs> that's what they did so so you got an email asking for you to send a power sentence in. No, no. Everyone got this email. Right, right, right. right. Okay. Yeah, everyone got this email. And have you written your pa- – and is it a power sentence or sentences? I think it, it can be more than one sentence. And is it – it's not as long as a bio is for what I'm gathering. No, no. It's like maybe two sentences, I think. And what is yours? I don't know. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> so I think it's – I think it takes some time. To figure it out. I'm not saying it's not worth it. I'm just saying I don't think it's a, like, there's the word power in it, right? Like, you, you better convey power in your two sentences. Well, I think I think it's the basic idea is, okay, so I, I think it's like, maybe, actually, it's, I think they, it's what, the example that they gave was one sentence. And it's basically like, Roger Pang studies how the environment affects health or something, something a little bit more detailed than that but not much more detailed i was gonna say that doesn't sound like a power sentence <laughs> Are we, maybe we should like write this on the podcast <laughs> maybe but do you know what i'm saying it's sort of like okay great like well i mean you know but you gotta imagine who's reading this it's not like it's other scientists reading this right this is for like marketing material right uh-huh and so it's got to be so so i agree that you know my first draft was not great <laughs> but um it's uh, it's going to be some variation along those lines. All right. So when we have our next episode, can we do a... F- I will come back with my power sentence. All right. Excellent. Actually, it's actually due this Friday. So okay. <laughs> I, have, I have to come back with it. <laughs> and I dispute your hypothesis a bit that the reason that, you know, a major reason that some faculty are highlighted and not others is because the communications team has power sentences on some people but not other people i didn't mean to say that power sentences alone is what makes this happen i just think that some faculty are more engaged than others and those are the ones that get featured generally speaking so you're going to up your engagement level yeah why not and then we're going to see we're going to count how many times you're featured in the public health magazine well you know this is dual use material right because not only do i get a power sentence but then i can also talk about on the podcast see i'm like i'm spreading out over multiple platforms here wow you're leaning in exactly right (laughs) (laughs) so i'm just saying think about how these things think about how like if you think about how these processes work well no that that i think there is a whole maybe for another episode is it's worth thinking about or talking about sort of communications in general and kind of how they work and what, um, and and this is only from the end user, the faculty end user perspective, but like what a communications or media relations team does at an institution and how you interact with them and how they have different channels for communication and how they might think about those different challenges, uh, channels and how, you know, why it is that some people tend to get profiled rather than other people. Like, yeah. should we should we tackle that maybe as like a meaty main topic in a future episode? Yeah, okay. All right, pet peeves. Let's hear it. I don't know whether this is like a generational thing. Like, is it a cohort effect or is it a geographic spatial effect or is it something on the space-time continuum? <laughs> but I have noticed that people are putting spaces in file names instead of underscores or not having any spaces. I just want to say, when I saw this topic in the outline, I laughed out loud. You did. It's definitely not a spatial thing. It's definitely a time thing. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Well, what's your issue? Let's finish this first. 
I was trying to think about what exactly my issue was. Um, and so I think the holdover from this, but this is speculation, you'll know the answer to this is that, you know, when you're like writing code, you know, and interacting with a computer, it, it matters whether there's like one space or two spaces there sometimes, right? Then some, the code won't run. And so to be clear, oftentimes there's like an underscore, um, particularly if you want to separate out like two words so they're more easily readable. Um, and so I think partly this bothers me because I was kind of just acculturated that you don't like have these spaces. Um, and then I think in reality, it does expand the name. So you can't see as much of the file name because oftentimes, you know, when you're looking at something through an application, like a file name, you'll only see the first part of it. And it can make searches um, more difficult, um, you know, because of the spaces that are in there potentially. But that was as far as I could get. So I don't know whether this is just sort of this like, it just makes you feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm an old curmudgeon-y person and I'm like, what the? Like this is the, when I s s send a manuscript and all the double spaces between the sentences come back and someone's done a find and replace and made them all single spaces. Just because, you know, your introduction to computers took place like before there was even a Microsoft Excel, right? I mean. Yes, we've talked about that. Yes. <laughs> and I will remind you of that. Um Back in the day when primarily on Windows computers, you just couldn't do that. You couldn't have spaces in the file names, right? Um, and this technical limitation went on for like an unbearable amount of time. <laughs> uh, but it's finally been resolved. And now I think on every computing platform, you can have spaces in the file names and it's not a big deal. Um, and uh, so I encourage it. You encourage spaces in file names. Uh, I don't discourage it. Yeah, I use it myself. Really? Okay. Because it's like, well, put it this way. If having spaces can like make it so that the file name is more understandable, then I would encourage it. And why not just put an underscore there instead of the space? I think cause that makes it less readable. Look at you. <laughs> Changing I'm, with the I've times. I've embraced the modern age. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I'm glad, you know, I, I knew that you would shed some major insight in this and maybe I just need to get over it. So I'm all tempted to change the file name, right? To remove the spaces when I send it back to the person. <laughs> it's only a problem if you are the kind of person who uses an operating system that requires you to like type stuff on the command line. Then it's just then it's a little bit of a pain. Ah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell people, look, I really use the command line interface for most of my work. Yeah. Yeah. And and only you are laughing at this because you know how preposterous that is. <laughs> that would be the case. And I would say, you know, forget those people. I mean, they, if they want to stick to their command line, then they're their own problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Phew. Yeah. And why did you laugh out loud exactly? I just, because it's like, you know, it's something that only old people would. Uh, would you do. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm right there with you in terms of like being an old person with computers. Yeah. Lessons from space. Go for it. I only, this is a quick one. I only want to mention this because, uh, China has has recently launched a moon lander um, that is going to return rocks from the moon, which is the first time we've done this in, I think, 24 years. No, 44 years. Excuse me. Is that right? Wow. No. Well, no, 24. 19, 20. I, can't, I can't do math. Sorry. <laughs> it might be 44. I think it's 44. Yeah. Um, it's been a long time. Last time anyone did this was the Russians. Um, in the 70s so um and when you mean this oh uh, landing on the moon picking up some rocks and returning them to earth like a person like an astronaut picking up rocks and putting them in the pocket in their pocket or like no the russians sent a robotic okay. lander okay yeah. yes uh yeah so they brought back like 107 100 like 70 grams of rocks and i think the china is looking to bring back a little bit more than that but um Anyway, it's interesting. so they're orbiting the moon right now. They launched on Monday, I think. They're orbiting the moon right now, like a week ago. And there should be landing any minute now, really. And you don't have like the live video feed going on while we're recording? China is not wild about live video feeds as far as I can tell. <laughs> they actually live broadcasted the launch, which was a little unusual. And not only that, it had like English commentary. Um, but 
they're not they don't seem to be live broadcasting anything else um so uh i only bring this up because uh, i don't know it's because it's like an interesting thing right and they're collaborating with the europeans on this um on the science aspect of it, not on the kind of technical aspect, and uh, and so once the rocks come back, the Europeans and Chinese scientists will, you know, we'll look at the rocks basically, um, and there are no Americans involved, right? Because uh, because because there's a law that says that Americans can't collaborate with Chinese like space the Chinese space agency, uh-huh. um, and so like people at NASA, nobody can collaborate with Chinese the Chinese space agency according to the law. Um, but, and I just want to say that, like, I understand why that exists, but it is, I think, unfortunate for science, uh, and for, you know, for technical development in general, that this is this law that says we can't talk to them anyway, that that's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> and, and it, this is just not, so this is, um, the segment now is not lessons from space. It's just from space. There's no lesson in there. Well, well, okay, to be fair, I don't know exactly what the origins of like the directive are that bans any kind of interaction with Chinese space agencies, probably security related. Um, but I think in general, there is like, especially under the Trump administration, there's been kind of like a, you know, a freezing of relations with China, right? Um, and that has trickled down into science, uh, into, into, like, into like our kind of science, not just space science, right? Right, right. Um, and uh, it's been... I think it's it's not hasn't been hasn't helped anybody. I don't think, um, and it certainly hasn't helped science. I don't think. So it's uh, it's unfortunate. And I hope that that will change soon. I guess. Stay tuned. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Main topics. This first one's yours, and I'm like super fascinated to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> this this first topic touches kind of like a lot of. Checks a lot of boxes for me, put it that way. <laughs> so, and I bring it up. So, there was a Harvard Business Review art- article a couple of weeks ago, and it's called "How Apple Is Organized for Innovation." Apple being the computer com- or the company, <laughs> Apple Inc. Um, and uh, it's written by Joel Padoni and Morton Hansen. So, Joel Padoni is—they're both employees at Apple. And Joel Padoni used to be the dean of the School of Management at Yale, um, and then he was recruited into to apple to start something there called apple university um which is really just like a kind of organization that tries to kind of like teach the culture of apple there and so like it's for new employees or for new managers it kind of gives them it teaches them like how to manage at apple basically it's like an internal university kind of play thing and i think you know a lot of companies have something like that uh to kind of like keep the continuity of culture going basically uh, or to do just like basic uh continuing education you know so uh so that's, that's who he is he wrote this article for the harvard business review and um and so just at a high level i i want to talk about this just in terms in the context of like university organization um and if only because i feel like a lot you know this these kinds of ideas from something like the harvard business review might seem foreign to people like us uh, but they have a way of filtering back into our lives. And so I feel like it's good to stay on a little bit on top of some of these ideas that are out there in other contexts to, so that we can anticipate their arrival at the university campus. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. They always filter back into our lives. Even like language, I've noticed that, right? Like people used to yes. say, well, I work in such and such field or area. And then the, the private sector started saying, well, I work in the such and such space. And then it was like, Five years later, people in academia started using that term. Right. So I feel like we could stay on top of the news here if we like anticipate what's going to happen five years from now. Not that there's anything we can really do about it. <laughs> it's like there's no intervention that we could decide to like change the course of history. Well, you could you you could be the person who tries to like actively import this into academia. Well, I'm not sure I want to be that person. That's All a little right. bit the point here. All so. Right. I think there's a lot of fascination with Apple in general. It's the largest company, market value company in the world. It's like, I can't remember. It's like close to, what, it's like one and a half trillion dollars now. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in how it works. How, why is it successful? How does it continue to kind of to develop new things? Um, and so I'm, I, I mean, I'm just fascinated by the article and by the company in general. And so I found the article interesting. So, but there are a couple of concepts here that I thought are worth talking just to see how they might or might not apply at a university um and so 
maybe I should talk about so universities like so Hopkins in particular is managed using what's called the responsibility center management technique, right? Or RCM. Uh, and the basic idea is that like every school at Hopkins is like a separate little sub company, right? So the school of public health, the school of medicine, arts and sciences, engineering, school of education, et cetera. And they have to run their business, right? And they either are in deficit or they're in surplus every year. And if they're of a surplus, then, then that's great. If they're in deficit, then they have to figure out how to make it up, right? And Hopkins in particular doesn't really do something where it's like if the School of Medicine is in deficit and the School of Public Health is in surplus, we don't just move the surplus over to the School of Medicine and like balance it all out. Right? The School of Medicine has to figure out how to deal with their deficit on their own. Uh-huh. And that's the responsibility center management approach. They, everyone has their own kind of in – a, in a corporate setting, you would say profit and loss, right? Um, and so – and you have to deal with your own thing and there's no like – there's only a little bit of kind of, you know, shifting the funds across divisions, and that's the what we call it subvention, right? So, uh, and anyway, so but there's not a ton of that, and so everyone's kind of on every division's kind of on their own, right? And, and I would also say that, like to some extent, that's true of individual PIs with research programs, or like a center or an institute, or like in this in this model. Like it's not just at the department level that this model can like propagate down to lower levels on the org chart. Right. It can happen at the individual level. Right. Uh, right. For example, you are responsible for your effort, right? You get all the grants for the salary support. And if you come up short one year, then you are responsible for dealing with it, right? And if you can't make up the funds, then we'll just cut your salary, right? Um, That doesn't always happen, but it definitely does happen. Um. And so, and some departments have like a way to smooth that over. You know, they have a way to kind of a little bit of an insurance pool there. But some departments don't, and so you're on your own. Um, so, and also, you know, the other thing that that's worth I just want to know is that this is often how athletics are treated. And so, uh, you know, so athletics pay for themselves, right? And so, the, it's I, I just because like you often see you know coaches get like million dollar salaries, or whatever, right? But that money doesn't come from. <laughs> It doesn't come from us, right? It doesn't come. It comes from ticket sales, right? So if there were no ticket sales, there would be no million dollar salaries, right? So, um, so that money is kind of contained. Are you defending coaches being paid so much? Uh, well, I'm I'm not defending it or not defending it. I'm just not. It's like that money. It, it, that money exists only because there are sports, right? It's not like they're sacrificing professors over here to to like pay. I guess the coaches they could they could pay, if they pay, arguably if you believe that the coaches getting paid less would cause a team to be worse then you would be defending them but depends on how much right you right believe that but, right or if you could say that the athletic revenue should go and support you know should be transferred should be you're saying that the if you believe the athletic revenue should be transferred right that's a different model that's not RCM right but then you also believe that public health money could be transferred to athletics too right right <laughs> Well, that ain't ever happening. <laughs> no, it's not. So anyway, you, as a matter of principle, you either believe in transfers or you don't. And so we don't at Hopkins. And so <laughs> and it shows sometimes, especially with the medical school. Um, so and so anyway, so that's kind of like, so the article kind of goes, I'll we'll put the link in the show notes, obviously. The article kind of starts by how like, that's essentially how large corporations are organized um as like by different products right so if you work at a large corporation every product is kind of like their own little fiefdom right and uh, the manager of that product has to deal with everything about that product and it's like they have their own profit and loss they have to manage right so if they're making money they're great and if they're losing money then they need to deal with it somehow um and part of the and the argument that they make in the article is that the issue with that kind of model is that it's well the benefit of that model is that it scales very well right you can have a million products and every product is managed by them independently and it doesn't matter you know how many, so you don't have to, there's no like communication that has to occur um, but the problem is that like then you have a bunch of managers who are managing their own products and they're competing with each other because they don't it does their their success you know is. It, is kind of they, is something that they manage on their own, and if other people are doing, are kind of taking resources from the company from them, then they're losing out, right? And, and so I think what, to be like very concrete about this, it, it's like if I understand it, it's a scenario where um, someone could be in charge of the iPhone and someone else could be in charge of AirPods, right? And 
the manager, or the unit in charge of the iPhone um, has their own profit and loss balance sheet that they're responsible for. And meaning, so they're competing for resources against the AirPod unit. But then there's another level, which is that that manager is in charge of every aspect of the iPhone from like the glass, you know, uh, right. surface to the, the chips and the, the chips, you know, everything. And so, battery, yeah. yeah. And so the manager is obviously not able to be an expert in the battery and the glass and the chips and the whatever. Like that's right. another part of this too. Yes. Yeah. And just another example might be like if you're managing the iPhone and I'm managing the iPad or something, right? Like they both need to be manufactured, right? So in theory, you could say, why don't you and I, why don't we collaborate on the manufacturing end and kind of like combine our resources there? But under like a divisional model, you know, where everyone just does their own thing, I would be like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to help you with your manufacturing because that's just, that's going to, then I will have fewer resources in terms of manufacturing. I want to take all that manufacturing resources for myself, right? So screw you, right? Um, and so that's the downside theoretically. Um, yeah. The other thing that is mentioned is that like when you have, if you have a product based organization, everyone kind of like manages their own thing, then you, then there's no way that the individual manager can be an expert at all the different components of the, uh, product. Um, so, and so they end up not really having any expertise, uh, at the top of the hierarchy. That's kind of like the bottom line. And so there, so the article is about how Apple is a quote functional organization where the, the leaders of the organ are of the different functional elements are kind of, uh, the leaders of the company. So like design, hardware, software services, these are the, so, and everyone kind of, and so for any given product, all the leaders of these different functions have to work together um, because uh, there's no product that like can't have hardware and there's no product that can't have software, right? So everyone has to work together on every product. And, um, and so that requires collaboration, uh, but it also, and which is, which requires a certain kind of skill, obviously. And um, but it also limits the number of things that you can, produce right because like you if everyone has to collaborate on every product there's only so many things that you can do that before there's like too much communication there's too much overhead right and so that's why a company like apple really only has a small number of products relative to like a large conglomerate like think of like something like samsung samsung makes phones they also make you know like trucks i think they I mean, they make everything right um and so it's uh, you, well, whereas Apple only has a, f a handful of products really that they make. And and one aspect of this that I thought was emphasized in the article was that the leaders then are true experts in in the the unit that they're leading. Like they're truly an expert in hardware, or they're truly an expert in software, rather than someone who's not an expert across like all the iPhone components. If you organize things around the product, right. Uh, and their lo their rationale is that they work in a fast moving industry, like you know technology or computing, and they have to rely on expertise to make decisions because there's not enough time to like go out into the market and get feedback. By the time you do that, then your competition has like leaped ahead of you, right? And so you have to rely on experts who know the area and can make decisions without any external market based feedback. Um, and so um, that's the rationale that they say, I guess. Well, and I think I think there we'll g maybe get to it, but I think there is an you know an analogy in academia. Okay. Do you want me to dive into it now, or do you want to go for it? Yeah. So um, this goes back to a topic we discussed a while back, which is that you can't read the literature and then become the expert and know exactly where the field is, the scientific literature. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is that what's published now, even in the era of preprint servers, were the ideas that were percolating like a couple of years ago. And so the ideas that are percolating now are not published anywhere. You know, I mean, anywhere may be too kind of much of a blanket statement, but they're they're hard to discern from whatever existing literature. There is because there's not yet evidence yet that's been published. Um, and then the other piece of it is that um, there may be things that are alluded to in publications um, that um, 
are not necessarily ideas that are, you know, kind of getting ready to trend, but they're sort of the way um, kind of the field sees the body of evidence that's been published. And that can be hard to understand when you are kind of trying to read the literature and become an expert because you don't have context for understanding, you know, that why this paper was sort of considered garbage and you should downweight it and this other paper, you know, aside from things like, oh, this made it into some glamour journal or something like that. And so that lack of context, I think, makes it hard to interpret in any kind of sophisticated way the body of literature. And then the body of literature doesn't reflect really what the ongoing kind of conversations are about what what people are are kind of starting to research now right and i think the extent to which that matters you know the ongoing like up to date information about like how people feel about a certain thing you know differs from field to field i think but i think the point in this article is that like if you work in an area where things are moving quickly then it's critical to have like an understanding of that that current feeling right um, like I feel, I, you know, a lot of areas in biology, for example, which are in fact driven by technology. Um, I think it is critical that you kind of have a you 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 know people and you are kind of like have conversations with people about the current understanding of certain things, right? Which aren't necessarily going to be in the published literature. Um, like for example, if everyone thinks that this technology is crap, like there isn't necessarily going to be a paper out there that says that this. Everyone thinks that this technology is crap, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. right. Um, but like everyone knows it, right? Because you talk about it at conferences and you talk about whatever, right? So, um, it, yeah. So there's a general principle of like you can't know the field unless you do the field, right? Um, and I think that happens. I, I see that a bit, you know, when just as a statistician and seeing people do like with data analysis. I think there are a lot of people who are thrust into a position where they have to manage people doing data analysis when they haven't necessarily done a lot of it themselves. Um, and then it's like, uh, it's interesting to kind of see, like, because it's often, there are a lot of, kind of, just like any other field, there are a lot of things that you kind of have to, like, and I think data analysis is particularly bad because it's not like there's like any strong theory of how to do it and, you know, or like a structure for exactly what to do at any given time. And so, um, a lot of it comes from the experience doing it. Right, right. And I would say for that reason, even when you have experience doing it, it's like an exponential leap to, to manage someone who's doing it on your behalf. Right. Um, it, it's, a, it's a totally different ball of wax. So what are, like, what are the take-home points? Well, uh, a couple of things. One is that, you know, so that one thing that they say is that one principle – that they have is that leaders should know the details of their organization three levels down. Would you say that's true of the leaders of your organization? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I you also, don't have to answer. <laughs> yeah, no. I also look at this, I mean, I'm, I'm being like a total narcissist here, which is I'm sort of then asking, my instinct was to immediately say, okay, do I know what's going on three layers down in my own research team? You know, and, and should I? Um, it depends on what level of detail you're talking about. Like, could I perform the task of my research assistant, like collecting a particulate matter sample in the home? No. I don't think that's what the requirement is. I think the requirement is that you could dis uh, uh, describe in great detail what it is that they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, and some people, I think, think I'm like, I would say on the spectrum of like, whether you want to call it sort of a control freak or whatever, I'm probably pretty intense about the level of detail that I know about what's going on. Right. But. I think, yeah, exactly. And I think there are a lot of people who would say, why are you, why are you like perseverating over all these details? Like you don't have to know all that. Right. Right. Um, and I think often you don't, but if you do want to make fast decisions about certain things, then it helps to have all those details at your fingertips. Yeah. Well, and also, well, from a scientific standpoint, it's a way of sort of, being rigorous about the work, like data collection. Right. Yeah. And to take kind of the responsibility for it. Right. Right. Um, I don't have a large organization or really any other organization yes, <laughs> that have, works yeah, under me. Yeah. How many layers are under you, Roger? <laughs> there's at most one, I'd say. Oh, um, there's, there's, a, there's one layer under you. 
So I think I'm I def but I I think I have a good sense of what happens one level down for me. Yeah. That's that's a relief. Yes. The other thing that they talked about was like they they highlighted one particular person whose name happens to be Roger also uh Roger Rosner who runs their kind of uh productivity work software kind of um management. And uh he, they talk about there's kind of like four areas that he deals with. One is like in, like information like her kind of like areas that he owns. And then there's areas that he's learning um, and areas where he's teaching something to other people. So like people that work for him and then areas where he's delegating, where he really doesn't know that much about it. But there's people who can kind of take full responsibility for those for those er- for those things. So he's not highly involved. I appreciate it. There's a figure, right? Yeah. Because they they align these four areas according to these two axes um, that have to do with like how much expertise he has. Right. And I've forgotten what the other axis is, but it, it was like. Oh, yeah. High expertise versus low expertise yeah. and then highly involved in the details versus not right, highly right. involved in the details. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, and they have they have like a division of the like 40 percent is in like highly involved and highly, highly expert. And then 15 percent is like not that involved in low expertise. Um, and the remainder is on the other two cells. So I thought it was a good kind of framing of like what are you doing at any given time you're either owning something you're leading you're learning something you're teaching it to someone or you're delegating it right um and i think I, even as professors there's a certain amount of that that you have to do of those kind of that certain amount of that, that kind of separate uh what's the word uh distinction that you have to make between the various activities right and so and this style of this kind of org structure is what's it called again it's like a functional functional yeah and is the name of it because i don't think we've said what the name of it is and do you think that universe so universities are tend not to be that way right and do you think that they should be that way or you think it's not possible for them to be that way I don't think it's possible, uh, if only because it would greatly limit the number of things <laughs> that we do. Um, and I think professors in general prioritize like being able to do their own thing and study their own topics and learn their own things. And I don't think that necessarily, um, I mean, you know, if the university decided, you know what, we're going to forget everything and just focus on cancer, right? Um then I think this model would work, <laughs> right? Because then you'd have all the biostatisticians working on this, you know, on this problem, all the, you know, internal medicine people, all the engineers, all of the biology people, you know, everyone's focused uh, and they would all be working together and uh, you wouldn't have like the medical school has their biostat department and the public health school has their biostat department and the arts and science school has their stat department, you know, it wouldn't be like that, right? Um, but maybe that is it. But I think I, I don't think I don't I don't think this is a good idea because it's like you know universities aren't product based organizations in the sense that like we don't that's not like what we produce right 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 um, uh, and so it's a very different kind of thing that we produce and I think you can't really model it. But I do worry though. So I don't think it's a good idea for a university even, or even one of like especially for like a larger one. Um, but I do worry that <laughs> there's there may be a certain attraction to this kind of model. If you are a university president, ah, right, because right. this kind of model is very centrally organized, right? Um, because there's no profit and loss statement for the individual divisions. There's just one at the very top, right, for the whole organization. And I can see the and and I can see I, you, you can almost see the like you know the uh, press releases now, like how you know Johns Hopkins is reorganizing for innovation, right? Right. Right. <laughs> and uh something along those lines and um and we're going to increase collaboration and cross divisional communication and uh you know you've heard it all before right yeah oh yeah and so that worries you it yeah it does um because i think it would destroy what fundamentally is kind of good about being an academic and but I do think that there is this trend to like turn universities into businesses, right? And uh, and, and that we produce things, right? And um, this is maybe one way to do it, right? So interestingly, um, Dell Medical School 
in terms of its financial structure, started out very much um, as with a central budget. And over time, as it has sort of developed, it's become more uh, decentralized to, to the department level rather than sort of the dean's office level. Um, and, you know, that's happened a little bit more each year. It's not nearly like, you know, kind of Hopkins was when I was there. But um, I think it became, you know, the, the, the forces that have been applied that have led to this are, you know, people at the department chair and lower levels who are like, you know, I'm interested, it's the diversification of all the activities that people do, right? And then you hire faculty who have a particular interest in X area. And it's, you, you, you no longer, as you start to grow in size and hire faculty across, you know, with a whole diverse set of interests and skill sets, um, not everyone can be kind of put under the same budget and has the exact same goals in terms of, like you said, developing a product or what have you. Um, so it seems like the, the, the environment and the forces of the environment are pretty strongly against that kind of thing happening, even if a university president declared that that's how they're reorganizing for innovation. Yeah, and I just and I just don't think that is what the faculty have come to expect right, in general. Right, right? right. So it's um So we're like out of time. I think we are out of time, yes. So the only teaser we'll give, we'll talk about it next time, is that um we gave a teaser title. And all I will say is one of the comments on our R01 summary statement was that the hypothesis that we proposed was already known as fact. Correct. <laughs> So we will dissect that next yeah. time. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, very quick weekly grind. Um, I had a couple days where I did absolutely no work. What was that like? It was like amazing. And I think I had not done that since like like two days in a row. I think I hadn't done that since December last year. <laughs> yeah. In all seriousness, it was yeah. like so fantastic. So that's my weekly grind. I um, we're, it is the season. I wrote a uh, promotion letter, and um, there was something I was going to say, but now I can't remember. Anyway, it was a promotion letter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um. Anyway, but it was an easy one to write. That's I always like. It's always nice to write the easy ones, you know. Um. I was wondering though, maybe that's a topic for we haven't really talked about like how to write promotion letters. Um, have we, or maybe we have, I don't know. I don't think we have. I think maybe we've, maybe we've just written, discussed letters of recommendation generally, but not promotion letters. Yeah. Promotion letters have a different vibe to them and often a different structure. I thought might be useful to, to kind of talk about how we organize them. If you think it's a good topic. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So stay tuned. We have a lot of topics lined up. Yes. So thanks, everybody, for listening. You can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at The Effort Report, and you can email us. Our email address is theeffortreport at gmail.com.